Well, good morning, Ian. Thank you very much indeed for, for talking to us and thank you for flying in from, from the States to speak at our conference today. Um, I wanted to start with a pretty basic question, which is um, many people in the audience today won't have come across the term risk adjustment before. H how would you um, explain that term of risk adjustment to the non-expert? To me, risk adjustment is a system of reducing clinical risk in a population down to a single number. We are able to use risk adjustment, uh, which is derived from the conditions and the diagnoses present in a population. We are able to reduce that to a single number so that as we compare populations, each population has a number, its risk score. And so if you have a, you're taking care of a population whose average risk is 1.2, and I'm taking care of a population whose average risk is 1.0, my population is, from a risk adjustment perspective, relatively less risky and is expected to use less resources in terms of taking care of them. And it's important, I think, because if you're taking care of a population that's 20% riskier, in general, we'd like to give you 20% more resources to take care of your population. Thinking about the use of risk adjustment in the US, what would you say have been the major successes of, of the technique? It's used a lot, and it's been used a lot now, both in Medicare and um, commercial populations, that means employer populations. Uh, it's been used for in three different ways, I would say. It's heavily used within the Medicare system for a system called Medicare Advantage. And just to be clear, so people might not be familiar, Medicare is government funding for older people's Older healthcare, people 65 right? and yeah. older, and a few people under 65 who happen to have disabilities, but mostly people 65 and older. And, and sorry to interrupt again, Medicare Advantage is... Do you want to Medicare Advantage well? is yeah. a system with about 15%, there are about 40 million people who are eligible for Medicare 65 and older and, and disabled. Medicare Advantage, about 15 million of those people choose to sign up with private health plans who are reimbursed on a, um, on a fixed amount, HMO type um, reimbursement. So kind of capitated a budget. Capitated words, budget. And they're responsible for providing all the necessary services to the population that they serve. And because people are free to move between different health plans, uh, Medicare Advantage health plans, it's quite possible that a health plan could, uh, could attract, again, this disproportionate uh, group of people with higher morbidities than some other health plan. And so the, the risk adjustment system within Medicare moves dollars from the relatively low risk populations or health plans to the relatively high risk health plans. So in um, other words, making the whole system fairer, basically. The whole system is, stays cost neutral. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing, um, we're seeing the system spread out into commercial, largely in the commercial populations I would say it started off as an underwriting tool used by actuaries. The way that actuaries used it was to assess the relative risk of an employer group coming into a pool and to set premiums based on the relative risk or relative mobility of the population who are enrolling. We're also seeing it spreading into Medicaid. That's the system of providing coverage to the uh, poor. Um, and you may remember that I sit on the board of something called the Massachusetts Health Insurance Connector Authority. Uh, we provide the only, at this time, the only health insurance exchange within the US. And we apply a system of risk adjustment uh, within the plans that people choose. Uh, within our exchange. A, a very similar kind of risk adjustment applies as is done for the Medicare population. So it's very prevalent. I would say it's unusual now to find any segment of the market where risk adjustment isn't applied. Great. So you said that was the first major application? Yes. Underwriting is the second, so we, I covered that. And then of course there's the what you would in the UK call case finding, mm -hmm. which we've been doing now for many years. Um, disease management was a very big industry. It's, it's a little past its prime now perhaps in the US, but um, we, we've always done a lot of predictive modeling, which is the other side of risk adjustment. Always done a lot of that for case finding, for people to manage. And the idea there is to try and identify people who are going to be high cost in the next Exactly. Yeah, Identify those high-risk patients and then try to manage them so that they don't 
exhibit the kinds of costs that you're predicting that they'll show. So we've talked a bit about some of the successes of risk adjustment. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the, the major pitfalls or risks of using this technique? I think there have been a couple of things, and I'm going to talk about this later in, in the conference. Some of the, um, some of the controversial areas that I've seen one of them is that uh, the risk adjusters that we use are perhaps not quite as accurate as obviously we'd like them to be, and that, that introduces some problems. And I've seen problems in my own consulting practice with uh, changes of mix within a population having an effect on a risk score, and therefore the relative risk of the population, um, and that then means that perhaps the uh, providers, the GPs, are not being paid as much as they think they should be paid. So that's been an area of controversy. Uh, a second area which I think has been, um, from the perspective of the payers, has been somewhat controversial. I, I described how risk adjustment is used in Medicare Advantage. What happened uh, as soon as Medicare Advantage plans were reimbursed based on the average risk score of their population, morbidity based, a whole industry grew up almost overnight of people who went around and examined medical charts to find unrecorded conditions, which then drove up the risk score. But of course it's a zero-sum game. And so what happens is as one plan adopts this method of driving up the risk score, everybody has to do it. And I don't think that's a particularly effective use of, risk of resources. And then I think the third area that we found, which, which I found very troubling and really want to do more work in, is the effect of the management of chronic patients, long-term conditions. Um, good management of those patients keeps their risk score down. But if you think about it, reimbursement, higher risk scores drive reimbursement. So what's happening is there's this this sort of disincentive, in a sense, to manage the patients to a lower risk score because you cut your reimbursement. And I'm not sure how we get around that, although people have suggested, um, you know, we see in the United States pay what's called pay for performance. Mm -hmm. So if you do a good job of keeping your patients um, to their uh, medications and their tests and things like that, you'd get paid more. A bit like our quaff, as we call it, the quality yes. napkin framework. And, and, and that may go to some of the way to, uh, to making up for this. But I, I think that's an area that people ha is under-researched under and really needs more work. And where do you see the, the science of risk adjustment going in the coming years? There's been a lot of interest in the Society of Actuaries, which you, you know um, I'm a member, the Society of Actuaries has sponsored three studies in the past and is currently sponsoring a study of non-traditional risk adjusters, looking at, um, at bringing some of the other kinds of uh, clinical information into risk adjustment. Of course, up until now, everything in the US has been based on uh, claims-based data, mm -hmm. the diagnosis and procedure codes that are present in claims. Um, We've been able to get hold of some data sets that include some clinical data. And so we're looking, we have a project that we're sponsoring looking at uh, what this might do in terms of improving the accuracy. Because I think that there's a lot of interest, at least in the US, in terms of answering the first of the controversies or the first of the issues I pointed out, which is risk adjusters are not as accurate as we'd really like them to be. Accuracy has grown over the 20 years that we've been doing the, the uh, Society of Actuaries studies but they're still not as accurate as we'd like them to be. So I think that's a big area that, uh, that we'll see development in using both clinical data and self-reported data.